Hello. If you think of yourself as a Christian, or even if you don't, the word gospel might spark a range of different ideas, images and emotions. When Christians talk about the gospel, they're not usually talking about one of the four gospels in the New Testament. They're normally talking about the message of the good news of Jesus Christ particularly as it relates to our spiritual condition and relationship with God. They might call it something like how to be saved or the four spiritual laws or something like that. In this video, I'm going to present two different versions of the gospel. The first is what I used to believe was the only true biblical and correct gospel. In fact, for most of my Christian life, so-called, I didn't even know that there was any other real gospel at all. And then I'll present what I now understand as a more correct and really good news gospel. While there may be some differences in the details of the first presentation, depending on which church or denomination you might attend, the most important and key points would be common to how most typical Western evangelical Christians would think of the gospel. The second presentation is quite different in some of the key areas and is more in line with what was believed and preached in the very early centuries of Christianity. And this is still largely representative of what the Eastern Orthodox Church believes today. And this gospel is increasingly being seen in the Western world as the true biblical good news about Jesus Christ. When we start to talk about the message of the gospel, we start with God. And God is in heaven. And God is holy and pure and good. And in his love, he created the universe, all life and us human beings. When the first human beings were created, they were created in God's image. They were also holy, pure and good. But tragically, it wasn't long before the first humans made a huge mess of things. They disobeyed God and rebelled against him and sin entered the world. We typically call this situation the fall. This was a catastrophe of inconceivable proportions. It meant that from that time on, every human being who was to come into the world was born with an inherent tendency to sin by rebelling and rejecting God. And this resulted in the catastrophic result of death and violence and corruption and disease and even natural disasters being let loose in the world. And worst of all, it meant that every human being was now cut off from God and destined for eternal punishment in hell. Now, because God is pure and holy and just and can't fellowship with sin, it meant that there was an impenetrable barrier between man and God. Now, humans were desperate to try to resolve this situation. And so they tried to find ways back to God. They couldn't directly approach him. So instead, they tried to find other ways back to God, some by doing good works to earn their way back. Some invented gods that they could approach and relate with. And so false forms of religion spread throughout the world. But none of these could repair the huge division between mankind and God. But still, God loved the world and all the people in it. And he saw the pain and suffering that man's rebellion had caused, and he didn't want to be cut off from all humanity forever. So he had a plan. He decided 
to come to earth as the man Jesus Christ. And Jesus went about explaining how mankind could be saved and declared that he was the only way for humanity to be restored back to God. And he even went as far as to be crucified on a cross in order to take the punishment for our sins. He was punished by God instead of us. He took the punishment for our sins upon himself so that we could escape the eternal death of hell and eternal torment. By his death, he bridged the huge gap between God and humanity. And so, because of what Jesus did, the way back to God was re-established in Jesus. And it meant that now the way was open for people to be forgiven and restored back to God and saved from hell. This is really good news. It meant that everyone could now be forgiven and everyone could be restored back to God. And it meant that nobody would need to go hell to hell after all. Yes! Uh, well, maybe not that fast. You see... While the death of Jesus certainly made it possible for people to be saved, well, there's more to it than that. Because although the punishment for sin has been paid, people are still sinners. And because God is perfect and holy, he can't have just anyone coming into heaven. He can't fellowship with sinners, remember? Hmm... So, how do we resolve that problem? Well, when Jesus went back to heaven after rising from the dead, he sent the Holy Spirit into the world. And the Holy Spirit's job is to help people to get to heaven. And he does that by revealing to people that they need to get right with God. Things like, Repenting for their sins. That means feeling really sorry about doing all the wrong stuff that we've done and rebelling against God. And by confessing to God that they're unworthy of forgiveness and ought to go to hell. And by believing that Jesus died on the cross for them and rose from the dead. And by asking God to forgive them and asking Jesus to come into their heart and make them clean enough to go to heaven. Oh, um, but there's a bit more than that. You see, even though Jesus died for people to be saved potentially, it's really all about what we do. Things like, we have to go to church, of course, and we have to read the Bible, and we have to tell people about the good news of Jesus and how to be saved and we have to give to the church and we have to do our best to not do bad stuff and do more good stuff and we've got to give more to the church and we've got to be involved in lots of programs and do more for the church and give more to the church and well you get the idea. So, even though it's possible for people to be saved, in reality, because it's what people do and what they believe that saves them, actually the estimates of the numbers of people that will actually end up being saved, some estimate about 10%, which means that the vast majority of humanity, about 90% will still be going to hell forever and ever with absolutely no chance of escape. Now, while this message might have some elements of the truth in it, and this version of the gospel has been widely believed and preached as being the only true message of salvation, 
it's actually based not on the revelation of Jesus Christ as known in the early church, but is actually based on Greek philosophy. People like Plato. And these ideas were also smuggled into the early church by groups like the Gnostics. And later on, people like Augustine wrote these ideas down and presented them as supposedly Christian doctrine. But the problem with this version of the gospel, which is not really good news at all for the vast majority of people, is that it's based on a fundamental lie. It's based on the idea of separation. God is over there and we are over here and we've stuffed things up badly and God is angry and full of wrath and he's most angry when we reject his son Jesus Christ and what he did for us but fortunately there is a much better truly good news gospel so right now you might be experiencing a whole lot of different thoughts emotions and even confusion you might be thinking, but that is the gospel. You might be arguing with me in your mind, or you might be ready to write down some really furious comments to put me in my place. But let me appeal to you to just cool down for a minute and let me show you why I believe that there is a much better version of the gospel. And after you see this, See if it makes more sense to you than the first version. In the New Testament Gospel of John, in the first chapter, John begins by telling us an amazing truth. A truth that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and beyond. And that truth is also picked up by the Apostle Paul in his teaching. And it also starts with God. But not just G-O-D, God, as some isolated character, but God as a community. The community of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. A community of total and complete love that has always existed for all eternity and who are totally inseparable in intimate oneness. And it was from that that all things have come. And because in the beginning there is nothing but this community of God, nothing could exist separate from God. So John tells us, that when God created the universe, they created it not over there somewhere, separate from God, but they actually created it inside themselves. So, God was unmade. And the universe was made. John tells us that all that was made was made in the Logos, or in Christ, in the Word, who is God, and who is fully in and with God. And he said that nothing that has ever been made has not been created in Christ. And that includes every human being ever created throughout all history. Because where else but from being in Christ could they have come? So, we actually start out by being in Christ and Christ in us. We were, are and always will be in union with God, 
even if we're not aware of it. And God being the ultimate loving relationship, we were created to live in relational union with them and each other, just as God is in relationship with themselves. This union of love with God and with every other person is what being created in the image of God is all about. So we need to understand then what really happened when sin entered the universe. When mankind in Adam and Eve turned away from God, and they did, it was because they were deceived into believing lies. Lies about God and lies about themselves. They, somehow, were deceived into thinking that they needed to do something to become like God, rather than by just relaxing, enjoying and being in relationship with them and through this relationship coming into full maturity. And they were also deceived into believing that when they did wrong, they were in mortal danger from God's anger and wrath with them. So they tried to hide from God. And this also resulted in them believing the lie that they were now cut off from God, separated and under the condemnation of God. And despite God coming to them in the garden in love and with a promise of ultimate restoration, the damage had been done and the lie that they had come to believe was perpetuated throughout all mankind. And because of this, the world lost the principle of love as the basis of all relationships and instead Fear, distrust and self-protection became the dominant influences in the world. Mankind became fallen, all of us, in our minds, believing lies but, and reaping the consequences of our false beliefs. But in truth, mankind never actually lost the image of God as those created in Christ, as both John and Paul go to great pains to declare. But the awareness and full manifestation of the God-like nature within man was lost, or, more accurately, became hidden and overwhelmed by fear and false beliefs about God and about ourselves. So although the universe and mankind were still in union with God from God's perspective, and that's the perspective that matters, and that could not ever be destroyed, there was a serious sickness in the minds and hearts of people that had locked mankind into destructive ways of thinking and living that would go on indefinitely unless something was done to correct it. And that is where Jesus comes into the story. Jesus came to earth as the full expression of God as man to man. He came to fully reveal the love of the entire Godhead, especially the love of the Father that had never diminished in spite of our fallenness. He came in the power of the Spirit to heal the sickness of sin with no thought of judging or punishing anyone. Jesus didn't come to warn us about impending doom. He came to save us and to show us the way back to living life in the fullness of our true identity as children of God that we had never truly lost. He even submitted himself to our death by dying at our hands. And so, in him, 
the entire Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, fully received and fully embraced all of our pain, our darkness, and our suffering. And in doing so, they absorbed it and destroyed it. Destroyed sin and death. When Jesus died, he wasn't killed by God. He wasn't killed at God's hand. The father didn't kill his own son. Which loving father would do that? Because Jesus had always been with and in God as God and were, they were inseparable. No. We killed him. As the prophets and Jesus himself foretold. And by submitting himself to this, he had begun the unstoppable process of healing and restoring the entire universe back to what it was always created to be. This is what was known in the early church as the apocatastasis, the ultimate restoration of all things in Christ. Far from being a remote and indifferent judge, willing to discard his own children into a place of eternal torment, our Father is committed to our full and complete reconciliation and restoration. And now, as this truly good news goes out into the world, and as the Spirit of God in us bears witness to the truth that we are and always have been fully like God in our true created nature, we are able to begin to live as we truly are as the image of God in the world, in the power of the Spirit. And this is our restoration, our salvation. And as one by one, from person to person, this revelation takes root in the earth and spreads everywhere, the world is on a path of total and complete restoration of all that was lost in Adam, including, ultimately, every person ever created. This is the fulfillment of Jesus' own declaration that the reason he had come was to seek and to save all of that which was lost. And just as in the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus will not rest until every single last one of us is restored back to him. So, Instead of a measly handful of people who manage to save themselves by their own works because of what they do or even what they believe, Jesus did all the work on our behalf and single-handedly, as the second Adam, saved the entire human race. This is truly the victorious victory of Christ. As I close, I want to ask you to do something, something that's really very simple, but powerful. When you're in a quiet place and you're able to relax, just ask God a simple question. Ask, God, are you truly in me? And I have every confidence that Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit will answer you and reveal that they are indeed in you, in loving union with you, and always have been. And this revelation to you, in you, will be the start of the most amazing journey you could possibly imagine. I hope you can sense your deep agreement deep in your heart with this truly good news of Christ in you, the hope of glory, as the Apostle Paul put it in the New Testament. And along with a rapidly 
growing number of people everywhere reject the legalistic separation and condemnation focused fantasy that we have wrongly called the gospel. If you have questions or you'd like to share your views on this presentation, please make a comment below. And if you'd like to be notified when other videos are posted like this one, subscribe to my channel. And thank you for watching.